Shall we uh, start with a prayer for Terry? Dear Lord Jesus, you are the physician of the sick. You've made many very, very sick people whole in their bodies and certainly in our souls. You've cured our sin sickness. You are the great physician. And we call upon thee in behalf of our sister in the faith, Terry. And she, in your infinite wisdom, was allowed to fall this morning and not be here, even though she would certainly love to be as she always is. We pray that her fall was not serious and that her knee will be restored by the sound that she can return soon, that you will heal her. We trust thee to be the healer, even though we go to doctors, they can only heal if you allow it. So we pray for Terry, she will bring her back to full health and be able to attend back very, very soon with us, to hear your word of light and life and truth. Hear us for thine own sake. Amen. So, we're talking about Mark. Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. And uh, here we have Jesus performing a healing at the beginning of Mark 2. Just a quick review. He's in Capernaum, which is where he lives. That's where his house is. And... uh, He's got a great following now of average people. Not too many of the Jewish leaders are believing or trusting or listening to him, but a lot of the just average people uh, are coming to him, not just for physical healing, miracles, but as you see in verse 2, the, they crowd into his house so much that they're actually uh, blocking the door so that no one else can get in. And he preached the word unto them, the word of eternal life and salvation, happiness and joy in the Lord. And uh, they come, uh, in verse 3, they come unto him, as it says in verse 5, people of faith. Uh, There's four people carrying this sick man, and Jesus sees all their faith. They all five have faith according to what it says in verse 5. True faith, not hypocritical faith, not what the world calls faith, but true faith in Jesus that he is Lord and Savior. He is the promised Messiah. And because of that, Jesus says to the sick man's son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And this is what faith brings. The instant a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus alone, not in themselves or anything else, their sins are forgiven by Jesus' death for their sins in their place. So that's the best thing God can say to anyone. It's the best thing that any person on earth can hear because the doors of heaven then are open to him. Thy sins are forgiven. And that's why Jesus came, so that our sins would be forgiven. Even though our sins deserve death and hell, Jesus took that punishment upon himself. And we thank uh, God every day for our faith, that we are as these five people that uh, climbed up on Jesus' housetop and lowered this sick, palsied man down through the roof. But there were, of course, the unbelievers there, and uh, they are always present. As Jesus talked about, the, the, uh, the wheat and the weeds in the field growing up together, uh, He talked about how on the last day uh, two people will be at the grinding stone and one will be taken and one will be left. One will be taken to heaven and one will not. So we as uh, Christians live side by side with the unbelievers. They're around us. And uh, that's why we're really here left on earth so that we can bring the word of God to them. Uh, But these are the Jewish leaders Uh, as it says in verse 6, called the scribes. And where you see scribes, you usually see Pharisees, and you look at this account in the other Gospels, and so it says that the Pharisees were there too. In fact, it says that some of them had come up from Jerusalem, the heart and soul of the Jewish hierarchy, 
had uh, been uh, hearing about this Jesus of Nazareth up there in Galilee and how big a crowd he was attracting. And they were starting to get a little nervous about this because they did not sanction him. He had not come to them for his authority. He was a renegade to them and a threat to their authority. So they were trying to pin something on him and uh, cause people not to follow him. And so they think they've got him now when they hear that he said to this uh, paralyzed man, thy sins be forgiven thee. Because they say in verse 7, who can forgive sins but God only. And uh, so they say that Jesus is claiming to be God or acting like God here, and that's blasphemy. Now that is true. Their statement is true, and Jesus doesn't contradict their statement. He's just going to prove that he is God, and he does have the authority to forgive sins. He alone can forgive sins. He alone works the forgiveness of sins by his own suffering and death for our sins in our place. So uh, he's going to prove to them that he is God. And uh, in verse 8, he reads their minds. Uh, He knows exactly what they're thinking, even though they don't say it out loud. Uh, And they're probably standing out in the street. And uh, Jesus wouldn't hear what they were saying, even if they they were saying it out loud. But he he does need that because he is God, and he can read everyone's thoughts instantly. But he goes to them, and... um, Or maybe he yells out to them. I don't know. It doesn't say. It just says that... uh, uh, he says to them in verse 8, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? This is a rhetorical question. In the eyes of man, which is easier? It's easier to say something than to do something. Words are cheap. You can say anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to be effective. You can say anything, but to actually heal somebody immediately, just to take a very, very sick person and immediately their sickness vanishes because you heal them. Uh, In the eyes of man, the healing would be harder. And you can say it, but if it doesn't happen, then you have a foolishness about you that you said something that you had no power to do. But with saying your sins be forgiven, there's no proof of it. So you can say it, and nobody can say you're wrong. Whereas to heal somebody, they'd have the proof. But then he, uh, he goes to verse 10. But that ye may know that the Son of Man, and this you know, Jesus refers to himself, hath power on earth to forgive sins... He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. So, uh, he doesn't call upon God's power. He just says, I say unto thee. Because he doesn't need to call upon God. He is God. I'm doing the healing here. That makes me God. Uh, and therefore I have the authority to forgive sins. Jesus will be our judge, the Bible says, when we leave this world. We'll be judged by Jesus himself, that God the Father has appointed all judgment to God the Son. So we look forward to seeing Jesus face to face and hearing him say to us, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. What a wonderful thing that will be. So uh, he uh, does the healing. He doesn't have to say the words, but he does say the words for their sake so that they know who is doing the healing here, not only the scribes and Pharisees, but everyone else who's around there. They will see this, and they will focus on Jesus, and it is his power itself. Uh, Back in... uh, 
the previous chapter, we have healings of Jesus occurring. For example, he, remember, cured a leper back there in chapter 1. And he spoke the word there to, uh, to him, I will be thou clean. And as in verse 42, as soon as he had spoken immediately, the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And uh, so uh, there again, he doesn't call upon God. He simply does it himself, showing that he is God, as he did back in verse 25 of chapter 1 when he cast the demon, uh, the devil, out of that man in the, temp- or in the synagogue. And uh, he never calls upon God because he is God. Now, he prays to God the Father many times, but uh, the power is his just as much as it is God the Father's. So he never calls upon God the Father to heal anyone or to work a miracle. He has that power himself. So he merely utters his word and the power of God's word, which we have before us now, the inspired word of God in the Bible, very powerful thing that the Holy Ghost uses to create faith, saving eternal life in people, sinners. So the word that he speaks here in verse 11 is an expression of Jesus' almighty will. He simply wills it, but the words express his will didn't have to say it. He could have just willed it, but he says it anyway. And he he simply says three commands. Arise, take up thy bed, go thy way into thine house. Three simple commands. And this man who is so badly paralyzed, so seriously paralyzed, that he had to be carried by others who went to the great trouble of carrying the man to Jesus and putting him down to the roof. must have been a a terrible disease that this man had really suffered under every moment of his life. Uh, Just instantly, as it says in the next verse, and immediately, just as it said over there with the uh, uh, man in uh, uh, chapter 1, and uh, when he uh, healed the leper... Verse 42, immediately the leprosy departed from him. Immediately. Uh, Not over a period of a few minutes or a few hours, but immediately, in a split second, um, this terrible paralysis is literally just blown away that quickly. That's how quickly God can act and does act when he needs to uh, for our good. He can do things immediately if it's for our good. If it's not, then he won't do it immediately, but we leave that up to him. Uh, The time that he answers our prayers is up to him. Anyway, the man's body at the end of verse 11 uh, and the beginning of verse 12 uh, is made sound and whole. As sound and whole as any very healthy person on earth. And how does he prove? He doesn't just, Jesus doesn't just tell him to be healed, to prove that he's immediately healed. Jesus commands him to do three things that prove he's healed right before everybody's eyes. Arise. Very hard for a paralyzed person to do. Pick up your bed. Even harder. And walk home, carrying your bed home. Uh, Very hard to do if you're paralyzed. Impossible. But now he can do the impossible because God can do the impossible. So he proves that he's healed. Jesus wants his proof to be seen by everyone there, including the scribes and Pharisees. How can they deny what they see? You know, most people have to see you know, like Doubting Thomas? Uh, doubting Thomas didn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. He, he doubted. Well, this is normal. It's natural. People don't rise from the dead every day. 
he knew that Jesus had died and was buried. It was three days. And people were saying, oh, I saw Jesus. And Thomas says, I don't care. I don't believe you. And uh, this went on for a week. And then Jesus came back and stands before Thomas. Jesus knew what was going on there with Thomas. He said, Thomas, uh, come here and uh, touch my hands and my side. Be not faithless, but believing. Some people have to see it to believe it. But then the next verse of the Bible says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, which would be us. We believe it because the Bible says it, by the power of the Holy Ghost. But Jesus wanted this to be seen, the, the proof of his power, the proof that he had fully and completely uh, blown away the paralysis of this man. So he also commands him to arise, pick up the bed, and go to your house. You'd think, you know, a, a palsied person, a paralyzed person, his muscles would be very small because they hadn't been used. It atrophied. Even if the paralysis, the cause of the paralysis could be taken away, he'd still have to have lots of what they call, what, physical therapy? (laughs) To get those muscles toned up so that he could even stand up. Jesus not only takes away the cause, but he takes away all of the symptoms of the paralysis immediately. God can do anything. He is all-powerful. Now, this is fully beyond even modern science. So-called medical science today, which is supposed to be so great, they could do nothing like this. They probably couldn't even heal the paralysis, let alone uh, have the guy immediately rise, pick up his heavy bed, and walk home. Uh, So, this is truly proof of Jesus' divinity. And uh, so it happens immediately, as it says in verse 12, which is the case with every single miracle recorded in the Bible that Jesus did. You will not find any miracle of Jesus that wasn't immediate. Again, showing that it's not some kind of a accident or a coincidence that it was the power of God and Jesus is God. So, Jesus has now proven what he says in verse 9. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise, take up thy bed and walk? Well, he's now proven that he can do the, in man's eyes, the more difficult thing. I can do the harder thing. So, by by reasoning and logic, I can do the easier thing, forgive sins. First he gets him to admit it, to go along with his logic and reason, and then he proves the harder to prove the easier. That he, he... If he does the visible thing, the harder thing, in man's eyes, he can do the invisible thing, too, the forgiveness of sins. So he took this terrible disease off of this man immediately. But before that, in verse 5, he took the awful, even heavier weight of sin against God, this mass of sin piled upon the sick man's soul, was also just taken away, blown away immediately. All that sin was gone. All the dirt, all the filth, all the blackness of sin in God's sight just made pure white. But Jesus says, thy sins be forgiven thee. Fit for heaven. God, many times in the Bible, describes what happens to sin because of Jesus. You know, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, they'll you know, there'll be as wool. Uh, I will drown them in the depths of the sea and remember them no more. Remove them as far as east as from the west, which is an infinite distance. Um, that we are perfect 
We are saints. We are sanctified. We are fit to be in God's holy presence forever. That's how clean Jesus makes us. Uh, Even one spot of sin remaining would keep us from God. Every sin must be punished. So Jesus, when he uh, suffered and died for our sins, he took away every last sin of every last human being on earth and uh, makes us perfectly clean as he made this man perfectly healthy from his paralysis. When he sends thy sins be forgiven, he, he means it. He doesn't mean some of your sins are forgiven, the little ones, but even the greatest of our sins. So he proves it. I've done the harder. You've just admitted that would be harder to do. I've just done the harder. Uh, so when I've forgiven this man's sins, I've done the easier. I have the authority to do the easier too. In your eyes. So now he follows doing the easier thing. Uh, First he did the hardest thing, forgive sins. That cost him his life on the cross, suffering and being forsaken of God, hell. Uh, Healing this paralysis was nothing. If I, you know, now, uh, if I've done the, the, uh, the easier in, or the harder thing in your eyes, I can do the easier thing in your eyes, forgive sins. But this is visibly present. This, this is instantaneously obvious, uh, this act of healing, which the man rose. And you have to picture, he didn't just rise, you know, shaking, you know, very unsteady and holding on to people. Yeah, or the walker or a cane or fallen down a few times. It says, he immediately arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. Uh, Just perfectly normal walking. A man who a moment before couldn't uh, even stand up. So, uh, he kind of, as it says here in verse uh, uh, 12, uh, He took up the bed and went forth before them all. He left. He walked out of the house. You can see him. He's kind of pushing his way through the crowd as he leaves. Is what that really is saying. And that would have been the hardest thing to do if I was the man that had paralysis. And yet a guy told me to go home. But why would I want to to leave that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, all right. But, you know, he does what Jesus says to do. Many times when Jesus healed people, he said, go home and tell people what great things God has done for you. Uh, So uh, he walks away, restored to perfect health, perfect strength, nothing wrong with him. Jesus doesn't do just half a job. And it says they saw it uh, in verse 12. We never saw it on this fashion. They saw it with their eyes. Proof is right before them (laughs) to even the Greatest skeptic, how could they deny what they just saw? And because they saw that, the visible thing, they now must believe the invisible thing. He can also forgive sins, which no eyes can see. But he did the first act. Well, I mean, he did the second act, which verifies the first act. Because he did the healing He also verifies now that the man's sins are also forgiven. His soul is also made perfectly whole. Uh, So uh, the uh, let's read all of verse 12. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed. Uh and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Uh, Two things that Jesus did here. He forgave the man's sins, in fact, not just in word, 
Truly the man was fully forgiven, a saint in the eyes of God by his faith in Jesus, but also this miraculous healing. He did both of them because he is God. Only God could do both of those things. That shows his authority, how he could do this. The only way he could do this, he gets his authority from his godliness. He doesn't have to go to the Pharisees or the scribes or the high priest or anything to get his authority. He's the authority over them. He is God that they claim to believe in, that they claim to serve. That's his authority. If you go back to chapter 1 again, notice uh, when he taught them, it says in verse 21, uh, they went into Capernaum a straight way on the Sabbath day. He entered into the synagogue and taught uh, Bible class, uh, sermon, whatever you want to call it. Verse 22, and they were astonished at his doctrine, at his teaching, just as much as they were at his miraculous healings. For he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. Uh, he has authority to teach the full truth and nothing but the truth. He has the authority to heal and to forgive sins. He has the authority of God. And then down in verse 27, in verse or chapter 1, verse 27, after he cast out the devil from this man, and they were all amazed inasmuch as they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Uh, the average person who didn't come with a lot of bias against Jesus had to admit it. He has the authority. He has the power to teach and to heal. The authority of God himself. And uh, so now, in verse 10, Jesus referred to that, that authority, when he said, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power, that's the same as authority, on earth to forgive sins. So, uh, he has the power to heal the sick bodies, and he has therefore the power also to forgive sins because it is the authority of God. It's the power of God. And uh, it's the same man who did both of these things, the God-man, Jesus, and he did it in his own name. Verse 11, I say unto thee, he doesn't call upon anyone else, doesn't call on God, doesn't call on God the Father or whatever. He does it by his own authority. And it's very very clear to everybody. What they see and what they hear, they put it together. This man must be God. He doesn't call upon God. He does these fantastic things, even forgives sins. We must go to him for the forgiveness of sins. And, uh, you know, verse 12, the reaction of everybody in so much that they were all amazed. They were all amazed. Now, in the Greek language that this was originally written in, what we translate amazed here is a very strong word. It means they were very amazed, not just amazed. They were strongly amazed, like they'd never been amazed in their whole life. Uh, oftentimes, when people observe Jesus, uh, both in his teaching and in his miracles, the reaction was what? Not just amazement. What would you think? What if you had been there? That's the word. Very good, Daryl. I think the scribes and the Pharisees would have had great fear. Yeah. <laughs> we just accused God of blasphemy. Right. Yeah. But they are so proud. 
They're so sold in their sinful ways, they won't admit it. At least some of them did, but most of them didn't. In fact, that's exactly the same word that Luke adds in his account of this. If we go to Luke 5 and uh, see how the Holy Ghost inspired Luke to describe this occurrence. Luke 5.26, or now let's, just to look at the context, you see what, uh, how Luke described the same incident. Let's go back to verse 24. Jesus said, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. Verse 25, And immediately he rose up before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Now look at verse 26. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and then were filled with fear. So that usually accompanies the amazement. When you see something that you didn't think was ever possible, it's natural in our sinful state to think fear. Uh, and so they were all filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Now, so we have amazement, we have fear, things that we can certainly identify with, going back to Mark 2. And it says, who was amazed? All. Just as it says, he went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed. No one who, who saw that, and they all saw it, were uh, greatly amazed and fearful. Now, we don't know exactly if the scribes and Pharisees are included in the all, if it just means all that were in the house listening to Jesus teach. It's not made clear. If we go back to Matthew's account of this, in chapter 9 of Matthew... Uh, this account occurs right at the beginning of Matthew 9. And uh, so it says in verse 7, And he arose and departed to his house. Then in verse 8, But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. How could, how could God become a man? Uh, and it says there, who marveled and glorified God? Verse 8. No, the, it said the multitudes. Now back in, March, uh, in Mark, it said they were all amazed. Here it says the multitudes were amazed. I don't know if that adds anything to it, if that includes the uh, scribes and the Pharisees, it's still not clear if they uh, glorified God. Somehow, I tend to doubt it. Well, they're probably amazed by it, but they really glorified God. Yeah, now they'd have to admit he has the power to forgive sins. They have to admit he's not a blasphemer, but they don't want to do that. So they deny what's right before their very eyes. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, I would too. Uh, and fear of God is a good thing. You know, I, I go round and round sometimes, even within our own synod. They say, oh, no, Christians shouldn't fear God. Well, I, I beg to differ. The Bible talks about fearing God. The righteous fear God. Uh, the righteous are called God-fearing people in the Bible. Uh, not fearing, uh, you know, uh, that we're not going to heaven, not fearing God's wrath, not taking away from God's love and blessing upon us at all times. But a fear of God, if what happens? If we That's right. If we fall from faith, if we start committing deliberate willful sin, it's a good thing, right? To have that fear of God that we have f fear of sin then. That's a healthy thing. 
But sometimes you'll hear pastors in the CLC say, oh no, we shouldn't fear God. That really means respect. Well, it doesn't say respect. It says fear. And uh, I think it properly understood, then you properly understand what the Bible means about fearing God. Even as Christians, we fear God if we were to ever fall from faith uh, by deliberate and willful ongoing habitual sin. That's right. I am sinful, you know, and then that's what makes me, because I had to create that fear, is I, I'm so unworthy, how can I stand before God? That's right. Uh, just as Peter did when he had witnessed one of Jesus' miracles, and he said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. In other words, like Adam and Eve, I, I've sinned, i got to run away from God, i got to hide from God. I fear him because of my sin. Uh, so... Uh, Fear isn't a bad thing if it's fear of God. That we should fear, as Martin Luther said in his explanation of the first commandment, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. We should fear God above all things. You know, I might fear this, but I fear God more. I might fear that, but I fear God more. Okay, so fear can be a very healthy thing. Uh... So, uh, it also says here in uh, verse 12 of Mark 2, the reaction of all of them, they were not all only amazed, but they also glorified God. Now, we don't know if this includes the scribes and Pharisees. Again, I say that seems unlikely. But they at least would have admitted it outwardly, even if they said, well, how can we deny it within themselves, you know, said to themselves that. But those who didn't come with this heavy bias of the scribes and Pharisees, who thought they had it all figured out, that they had done the good works, that they earned God's favor, that was their life, that that was everything to them, They, they just couldn't get rid of it. But the ones who came with an unbiased, uh, view of life, they they couldn't deny what they saw with their own eyes, right before their eyes, that this was a miracle that Jesus himself performed, and therefore Jesus must be God himself. Only God can do this, and Jesus did it. So they had to Acknowledge Jesus is God himself. Uh, and therefore, he certainly has the power to forgive sins. He's God. If you could do such a, such a glorious miracle of healing the body that we've just witnessed here. Uh and so they glorified God. That only God could do this. This has to be the work of God, and Jesus did it himself. He must be God. Um, let's go back to the account in Luke again for a moment. I'm going to point out one other thing there in Luke 5. The reaction in verse 26. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. We've seen strange things today. What does that mean, you think? We've seen strange things today. Something we've never seen before. Yeah. How many of the things, not just we have seen a strange thing today, strange things, plural, what, are the, what is the more than one? What have they seen today that was so unusual that they'd never seen it before? Well, they've seen him, Jesus, uh, pronounce the forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've seen him heal a man of sexual palsy. That's uh, right. And then, I don't know if they were with him earlier in the synagogue or not, but they seen him baptized. Yeah. They were the same people. Uh, yeah. 
they've seen those two things which they've never seen before, as you say very well, Daryl. First of all, obviously the scribes and Pharisees wouldn't ever pronounce anybody's sins forgiven. Why? Because they say, oh, I'm not going to commit blasphemy. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce somebody's sins forgiven because that would be blasphemy. So their, their scribes or Pharisees or rabbis had never done this. They never said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. So that was a strange thing to them. Some human being, seemingly just a human being, would say this. Yeah, yeah. Especially not under the authority of the chief priest and all that. Just some mere human being out of his own lips say, thy sins be forgiven. They like, that would be blasphemy. But yet we've seen him do it. And now, to prove he can do it, we've seen this thing we've never seen before either. This very, very sick man, perfectly restored to health immediately. Now, those are strange things. What they heard and saw that day. Certainly, uh, strange things today. Um, Also, another thing we see in this account Uh, before we finish discussing this account and get to verse 13, which starts a different account. One more thing we uh, see as we look at this whole account of the palsied man lowered down through the roof. Uh, uh, Jesus pronounces him forgiven and then heals his sickness. We see a connection here between bodily sickness and sin. Adam and Eve, in their created state, their perfect state, their sinless state, would never have gotten sick. They would have always had perfect health. But when they sinned, God pronounces the punishment of sin upon them, which is death. But also, before death, all these other bad things will happen in your life because of sin. There's a connection between sin and bodily infirmity and sickness. So anytime we're sick, and there's really no human body now that's perfect. Every human body has something wrong with it to some degree. There are no perfectly healthy human beings anywhere on earth. And all of this sickness that has created all of this massive uh, medical system that the world has put together, doctors and hospitals and schools of medicine and research and all of the uh, effort and attention and economy given to this of healing of bodily sicknesses. All that has come about because of what? Sin. Sin. Because man, by nature, has broken the commandments of his creator. That's the connection here, sin and bodily sickness. They go together. He heals the sin sickness. He also heals the body. Uh, So, we talk about the fall. The fall of man when uh, Adam fell. When Adam fell, the Bible says we all fell. All of their descendants fell. All mankind fell and Adam's fall is one of the hymns in our hymnal. And that brought sickness upon us all, and that brought death upon us all, physical death. Now, it is not necessarily due to a specific sin, therefore. And I don't want anybody to misconstrue that, that that I'm saying that. Jesus himself said that it's not because of a specific sin that you get sick. It's because of the fall of Adam and Eve that you get sick. You have inherited their sinful nature, and with that came sickness of the body. Okay? Now, there's always been kind of this uh, false uh, belief among people that, well, I got this sickness because I did some specific sin. That's not right. The Bible doesn't teach that. It's our general nature that we inherit from Adam and Eve. It was because of their fall into sin that all people get sick and die. 
not a specific sin of a person. That is why sin is so bad. People today think it's nothing. It's a joke. Uh, they, they play with sin like they uh, are playing with a toy train. When they should treat it, at, they're, they're playing with fire. Sin is a sickness of the soul. Of the human soul, it's a paralysis, you can say. It's a paralysis of the soul from which it is unable to help itself. Just like this man, this palsied man could not even stand up on his own. He couldn't heal himself. Well, he couldn't heal his sin himself either. But this is the belief of most people today, isn't it? And throughout the history of the world, every man-made religion is, I can heal myself. Not only can I heal myself, I must heal myself if I'm to go to heaven, if I'm to have any hope of a, of a good eternal life. I, can, I have to do it myself, by my own works. If I live in a good life, I can, I can heal my soul. No, my soul is paralyzed. I, I can't heal it. It can't heal itself. Uh, any more than this paralyzed man can heal himself from his bodily paralysis. Uh, we are conceived and born slaves to Satan. And we cannot, you know, our soul is enslaved to Satan by nature. And we have no power to break that bond, that bondage. We have no power of our own to repent of our sin and follow God. Uh, Although a lot of churches teach that, we don't. We are as helpless as this paralyzed man was to walk. Uh, the sin and the paralysis go together. So we cannot, on our own, spiritually speaking, rise up from our sinful nature. We cannot rise up or take one step towards God. We have a paralysis of the soul. So, we cannot help ourselves. We are paralyzed spiritually. We have this sickness of the soul. We are dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. And dead people can't raise themselves out of the grave. How then can we be helped? How can we overcome sin? How can we conquer sin? If we're helpless to do it, how can that happen? God has to do it for us, just like this paralyzed man. Only God can forgive his sins, dying for them. Only God can heal his body, not us. Uh, by the grace of God, and that's what grace means. God has love to his enemies, to his sinners uh, in the human race. Only God can accomplish both. It's just only Jesus could do these things that we read of here in Mark 2. So, healing and God's forgiveness go together. Only God can do them both. Just as sickness and sin go together, forgiveness and healing go together. Forgiveness is the greatest healing of all. It heals us eternally. So in heaven, will there be sickness? Nope. No sickness in heaven. No doctors, no hospitals. No medicine. No sickness. As there will be no death in heaven, ever, ever again, because there will be no sin. Everybody will perfectly in heaven love God and always obey him. And those are my final words and we're out of time. <laughs> so uh, next will come verse 13 which we'll pick up next time. Shall we close with the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. 
on that. 